Hello and welcome to another Java tutorial. In this tutorial, I'm going to continue our discussions on solving ordinary differential equations of complex functions. And uh, uh, I'm going to continue with another example. So, and this example is from an actual scientific publications. So here's the publication uh, from Satcher and Poon, Dynamics of Microwing Resonator Modulators. So this is an actual like uh, recent research. It was published in 2008. Maybe not very research, but uh, we see that as I mentioned before, uh, uh, this type of, uh, if you look at this publication, for example, the whole point here is to solve a differential equation that includes a complex function. And uh, the right hand side is actually a complex function that has complex coefficients. So that's one of the examples that we're going to look at. And this is called a rate equation, a complex rate equation of a resonant modulator. And uh, the rate equation is typically uh, basically DDT. T is the variable of time of some function equals some function, right? This is the rate equation because the left hand side is the rate of change over time of the function which could be real or complex and the right hand side is basically describing how this rate of change depends on the other parameters of the system right and you don't know you don't need to understand the physics of the system at the moment but in general we have some input uh, light that comes in a which in general can depend on time a of t and then uh, some of it goes into the resonator and it starts to go around and resonate and applying an electrical voltage to this resonator can alter the behavior of the resonator so v of t can be an input to the rate equation and then eventually what we're looking for is the output b of t right and then uh, uh, there is a state variable of the system which is the internal energy of the system but this internal energy is a complex number so the square the magnitude squared of this quantity small a of t is basically the energy stored in the resonator at, at each time but then because this voltage can affect the phase of the light inside this optical resonator we are also tracking not only the energy but also the phase of the system. So eventually the whole problem is solving this rate equation DDT of A of T is J, the resonant frequency of the cavity of the resonator as a function of time minus 1 over tau. Tau is basically represents the time constant for the energy to be lost inside the cavity. So it represents the how long it takes for the energy to be dissipated from the uh, resonator through the loss mechanisms that are inside the resonator so it's like the lifetime of the energy right and then a of t again is the state variable so we have a complex uh, uh, number which actually depends on time times the state variable itself the function minus j mu mu is a parameter that describes the strength of the coupling between the input and the resonator a of t a of t is the input uh, amplitude input light right so a of t is given mu is given tau is given and then omega res the resonant frequency is changing based on this voltage and in, in most cases in reality these devices work based on a linear function so omega rays is omega rays at zero voltage times one plus some coefficient times the applied voltage all right so these are mostly linear uh, systems in terms of the voltage to the energy inside the cavity so uh, and then the output b of t is uh, a is again a complex number is a complex function is minus uh, minus j mu a of t a of t again is a state variable of the cavity plus a which is the input which can also depend on, on time a of t all right so what we want is we want to specify the voltage v of t we want to specify a of t the input and we want to find the output b of t so V of T, this input signal is a voltage, it's a real. A of T is complex because light can have amplitude and phase. And B of T is also complex. And the output energy of the system is magnitude of B squared, right? 
And in order to do that, we have to solve this rate equation to find our uh, the energy inside the resonator as a function of the input amplitude of light and applied voltage, right? And here's the code that I wrote. So I'm going to assume that the uh, I mean there are two cases. One is that we don't apply any voltage, but then uh, we turn the light on and off in the input let's say we input a light a pulse of light and see how the system reacts by looking at the output so here a is one and then uh, this is the amplitude of the pulse of light so it's zero and then jumps to a and then comes down t0 is the initial time zero and the a0 is the complex uh, value for the a of t the initial condition which is zero all right so I'm assuming that at t equals zero, there is no light coming in. So there is no energy stored in the resonator. And then at some time I turn the light on and then at some other time I turn it off. So when I turn the light on, the energy starts to build up inside the resonator. And as a result, the output starts to change, right? So I define a function double double input light. T is the variable. So tau g or tg here is the unit time of the resonator. What it means is that how long it takes for the light to go one round around the resonator, right? So when the light comes in, it goes inside the resonator, it starts to go around, right? So for resonators, we always define this unit time. I'm saying that if t is less than 10 tg or t greater than 80 tg and tg in general it's around like uh, for actual devices it's about uh, like two three picoseconds so it's very small it's zero so before 10 tg and after 80 tg it's zero and in between it's a so i'm defining a pulse so it's zero the input is zero and then goes up to a constant complex amplitude and then comes down right and in order to solve this, I define this derivative function complex, which represents the right hand side. T is the real variable and A is my complex function, right? This goes to minus one over tau. And I have defined tau somewhere else like outside, but tau is just a number given times A minus J mu. I also have defined mu somewhere times input light dot apply at t so input light is a function that represents the input uh, a of t right so it's zero and then jumps up and then comes down and then i create my od solver complex object new od solver i pass in my uh, function which is this rate equation t0 initial value for the time and a0 initial value for the function which we already know that it's zero right if there is no input light there is no buildup of energy and then I define a time array from 0 tg to 250 tg. So I want to see what happens when light starts to go into the resonator and then up until the light goes around 250 times, right? So the time unit here is tg, 1000 points, right? From 0 tg to 250 tg. And then complex array A is OD solver dot Rangakuta complex so range kuta complex basically returns the solution at each time point at each point of time the complex solution right so if you recall we said that in the uh, previous lectures that the way we're solving this we're basically internally redefining the problem from a complex a single complex equation to two real complex equation and it becomes a system of two real valued equations that in fact couple to each other and each equation represents the real part or the imaginary part of the solution right and then we can put them together to calculate the complex solution because once we have the real part and the imaginary part we can find a complex solution all right and then the output power is basically the basically uh, the magnitude of the output b of t squared so i calculate minus j times mu times a at each time point i ai plus input light dot apply at time i right because if a is a function of time then it could be present or not present right if i turn the light on and off dot abs squared and this is a method in the complex numbers so this is a complex number minus j mu a plus input light that apply at time t 
and it calculates the ABS squared or magnitude squared, right? Which gives me the output energy or output power. And then I just uh, create a MATLAB chart and uh, I plot based on the normalized time, so T over TG, and then the output power normalized and the normalized output power, I just take the output power and normalize it to its maximum value. And then uh, I also plot the input light as a function of time. So I wanna see what happens if there is no voltage applied. So here I don't have any voltage. I just turn the input light on and off. And I wanna see how the cavity or the resonator behaves and how the output light behaves, right? That's it, so we I plot the output power, the output B squared, and also calculate the input light, which is A, all right? So let's see what happens. So this red one, here I have the legends, is the input light, and this uh, black curve is the A of T, is the energy inside the resonator, all right? That's our state variable. So A of T is a complex field or energy inside the cavity, and it's in fact our state variable. And as you can see, and as we expect, as soon as I turn the light on, the energy starts to build up inside the resonator. And once I turn the light off, the input off, the stored energy starts to get out, right? Because if there is no light in, as the light goes around, some of it gets out. And eventually, after a long time, all the light gets out and there is no light inside the resonator, right? So this makes perfect sense. And this energy is normalized to its maximum value. That's why the scale is from zero to one. Just, I'm normalizing just, it's easier to visualize what's happening, right? Now, now we can see what happens f at the output, right? So the red one is still the input and the output. So as soon as I turn the light on, uh, there is a still no energy inside the cavity. So uh, the output gets a very large spike of energy. And then uh, as the light goes inside the cavity, we expect the output to reduce, right? Because now the light starts to go more and more inside. So the output goes down. And again, once there is a sharp change in the input, the input is off, the output gets a spike. It's not as big as the previous one, but it still gets a spike. And then uh, it goes down again, all right? Because once the output input is turned off and uh, all the energy inside the cavity has been, has got out, I mean, the output is also zero, right? Because the output is a combination of the input and the stored energy inside the cavity, all right? Now, this is a fairly complicated case, but in general, rate equations appear all the time when you solve, for example, balanced rate equations for in uh, fluid dynamics. And uh, now we can solve them not only for real valued uh, differential equations, but also for complex uh, valued differential equations. If the right hand side is a complex, our state variable is a complex, it doesn't matter, we can still solve it, all right? Now, so far, this example shows what happens to the output when there is no voltage applied, uh, or in a more scientific term, when there is no modulation of the energy inside the cavity. So there was no voltage in this example, it's just, just the input is changing. I turn the input light on and off, and then the cavity reacts, and then the output also reacts, all right? Now let's look at the modulation. In the modulation case, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first turn the input light on. A of T is this uh, green curve. This green curve is input light. So I turn it on and then the output uh, and the voltage is still off. This red one is the voltage. So the voltage is off. I turn the light on and then we know that the output gets a large spike because uh, Initially, there is no energy inside the resonator, but then the energy starts to build up, so the output goes down. And then at some point later, when the output has, is completely zero and the cavity has built a lot of energy, I turn the voltage on and off. So I start to play with the energy inside the resonator. I start to distort it. And once I distort it, I turn the voltage on, the output starts to go up and then uh, reaches a steady state, a constant, and then as soon as I turn the voltage off, the output also goes down, right? So this is how 
we are translating the electrical signal this electrical voltage remember the voltage is an electrical signal electrical signal uh, on the light right the output is the light this is the out optical power right I mean the scale is not uh, it's been normalized so it doesn't matter it's just a normalization but you see how the output behaves so we are translating an electrical signal a pulse onto an optical signal this is called optical modulation all right performing optical modulation and uh, this whole paper dynamics of micro ring resonator modulators is all about this right and uh, uh, we see that how easy it is to, if we are able to solve this rate equation, it's very easy to understand what really happens. And again, the way we implemented this in Java really gives us a powerful tool for analyzing all these rate equations, all these resonant uh, structures. So this optical modulation, what, the, the thing that I want to point out here is uh, this rise time and fall time all this delay this time that it takes for the output light to actually get to its maximum value and it stays constant and then go so there's a rise time and fall time to the pulse even if i have an ideal uh, voltage pulse uh, my cavity the resonator doesn't uh, respond instantaneously because energy needs to build up any change in the energy has to uh, uh, take place over time that's why we see this rise time and fall time and there are ways to make the cavity faster uh, which uh, uh, it's related to the some quantity called modulation bandwidth or modulation frequency response you can just google it and see uh, look at different scientific papers about that all right so this was one of the very interesting examples even if you are not a scientist if you just follow these lectures, you should be able to solve these uh, complicated systems and see actually what happens in reality. And what I'm going to tell you is that if you build this and solve this equation and build and fabricate this device and measure it, you will exactly see this response. So this is not the abstract math that we're talking about. This is the reality. You will definitely get this response. I have done it. I have measured it. And this is exactly what you get. So believe me when i tell you that this complex structure this uh, is just described by this rate equation and we are able to solve it and uh, analyze it and that's very interesting all right now obviously the last step is that if i can solve a one ordinary differential equation of one complex function the next step is very naturally is uh, to extend it to a system of complex ODEs, a system of ODEs of a real valued variable X and uh, basically uh, M equations of M complex functions. So here in these M functions, uh, M equations, Y1, Y2, Ym are complex functions. They all have real and imagined parts. And therefore, F1, F2, all the way to Fm are also complex valued in general. They have real and imaginary part. X is, a, is real, is a real variable, and Y1 all the way to Ym are basically uh, complex functions. So the goal is to find these complex functions. We obviously need exactly M equations. If we have M functions, we also need exactly M initial conditions to be able to uniquely solve the system right and again the initial conditions in this case are all or can all be complex numbers are all complex numbers so how do we solve this so if each equation has a real part and imaginary part then we basically do the same thing we break this system down into real and imaginary parts of the functions right so from m equations we end up with 2m equations but those equations now are real valued. Everything is real. So we convert these uh, M complex equations into two M real equations. And once we do that, we already know how to solve it. So it's no brainer. We've, we've done it. We know very well how to do it for a system of real valued equations. So we define an array of size two M. And then uh, basically, uh, for each equation, I, I do it like this. So 
for y1 prime equals something i end up with the, the real part of y1 prime and the imaginary part of y1 prime so i have 2m of equations 2m equations and i the order is like this the real part of y1 the imaginary part of y1 the real part of y2 the imaginary part of y2 etc so the index of 2k k could be 0 1 2 all the way to m minus 1 is the real part of the function yk and then z 2k plus 1 and let me write it down here so k goes from uh, 1 2 all the way to m all right now obviously here our indexing is from uh, uh, indexing is from 1 to m but in java we index from 0 to m minus 1 all right so the idea here is that the index 2k is the real part of the solution yk and the 2k plus 1 is imaginary and then the real equations are arranged based on the real and imaginary parts of each complex equation all right so it's completely up to you how to how you rearrange the real and imaginary parts but i think it's uh, this is the more the most natural way the real part of yk the imaginary part of yk the real part of yk plus one the imaginary part of yk plus one etc all right okay so uh here's the way we're going to do it so we create a new object od system solver complex and we define deriv n function complex so deriv n function complex is like a deriv n function but instead of taking an uh, array of uh, double values for y it takes an array of complex values for y so we can go to eclipse quickly so in the od project in od package we had <clears throat> deriv n function takes the real value variable x and array of double values and returns the array of double values for all the equations and then derive n function complex takes the x real valued variable and the complex values y and returns an array of complex numbers which represents all the complex equations okay so this is our functional interface and then uh, what we are going to do uh, basically the idea is the same we take this uh, complex array complex function and transform it transform it into 2m equations of real valued equations of real valued functions and internally we create this func system that represents the 2m systems 2m equations real equations and then the od system solver that solves this uh, 2m real uh, ODEs all right that's the whole point so x0 is the initial value for x y0 is the initial value for y uh, for y the complex functions that's why y0 is a complex array number of equations must be equal to the length of the uh, initial conditions we must uh, there should be another an extra check here to confirm that the number of equations that is determined by the array that this complex function returns must equal to the number of initial conditions i mean i don't have it here but you should implement it that's an extra check to make sure that we can in fact uh, get a unique solution after solving the differential equation and then i'm going to also create an initial condition for those 2m equations after we break these m equations into 2m real equations so y0 real image is a double array of twice the number of equations so y0 real image at 2i index is the real part of y0 at i and remember y0 is complex or y0 at index i is complex and y0 real image at 2i plus 1 is the imagined part and again this is based on my convention that the solution or the when i break these uh, complex equations into real equations into the real part and imaginary part uh, the index 2k is the real part of the yk and the index 2k plus one is the imaginary part that's why the initial conditions also must correspond to this convention and now i'm creating the 2m system of uh, real equations so 
<laughs> I create an array of complex numbers for the M equations, number of equations, and this value I is basically uh so this z is an array of 2m elements so and it holds the values of the y functions z2i plus j z2i plus 1 all right these are the complex values why am i doing this because i have to pass the complex values to this complex function all right and then equations complex is an array and that's uh, basically after calculating the complex function at x0 and the values, the complex values of the functions. All right. And then uh, we have 2m or twice the number of equations for the equations that have been broken down into the real part, imaginary part. So 2i, the index 2i is the real part of the value of the function, complex function, and the 2i plus 1 is the imaginary part. So once I have all these twice or 2m equations, I create my OD system solver by passing in this function system, the x0 and the y0 real image, which is the initial value for the real part and imaginary part. All right, this is the whole idea. Once we do this, the rest is, the, is exactly what we already know. So let's head to Eclipse. So OD system solver complex, and the Euler method, again, uh, we have a method Euler sequence that generates an array sequence which has uh, 2m, the length of this array sequence is 2m. So it represents all the real and imaginary parts of all the m functions. And we just call the Euler sequence for this uh, OD system solver, all right? And then we can have uh, the values of the solution at each point the values of each uh, of all the solutions for an array of the input x so it's a two-dimensional array and also the complex array for at each point for all the m uh, functions which, which is basically we take them and uh, add the j here take the real and imaginary part and put them together or if we want to find the complex solution at some array of x values it should return a two-dimensional complex array. Similarly, for the Range Kuta, we just call the Range Kuta on the OD system solver. So everything is the same. No matter what method we use, this way of implementing solving ODs in Java, the way I'm doing it or the way we're doing it, it's a very powerful way because it's very easy to add more methods for solving and the general skeleton or the general way of implementation is exactly the same. All right? So back to the PowerPoint, here's an example. And uh, I have uh, an oscillatory system. We already have seen this system before, but in the past it was real valued function. So the coefficients are real. Y1 prime is minus Y2, Y2 prime is Y1, all right? So the coefficient, the equations are exactly the same. But now the initial conditions are complex numbers instead of real numbers. Now, in this case, if the initial conditions are real numbers, the solutions are always real. If the initial conditions are complex, the solutions end up to be complex. And uh, this system of equations turns out to have uh, exact solutions. And y1 is minus sine of x, the real part of it, plus j, 2 cosine minus sine. So it has a real part and imaginary part y2 is cosine of x plus j2 sine plus cosine so it also has a real part and imagined part and we can confirm that uh, at uh, x equals 0 y1 of 0 is 2j y2 of 0 is uh, 1 plus j and y1 prime 1 y1 prime is minus cosine plus j minus 2 sine minus cosine which is minus y2 and y2 prime is y1, right? y2 prime is sine plus j2 cosine minus sine. So this is the unique solution of this system of differential equations with complex functions. And we don't see it immediately in the equations that the solutions are complex, but the complexity of the solution, whether or not the solutions are complex numbers, in this case is determined by the initial conditions, all right? Now here's the code. I'm using the Rangikuta method to solve it. 
and uh, y1 is z0 here so i define my derive n function complex x and z x is a real number z is an array of complex uh, uh, values complex functions new returns a complex uh, array so z0 is y1 so z0 prime is minus y2 which is z1 so minus z1 and uh, z1 prime is y2 prime is y1 which is z0 all right and then x0 the initial condition 0 complex array y0 so y0 is the complex array so is 2j for the z0 and 1 plus j for uh, z1 and we create our od system solver complex new od system solver complex we pass in our complex function it's not a function it's an array of functions right it's two functions or two and a 2d array a array with two components passing our initial condition for x our initial condition for y which is a complex array an array of complex numbers and then we want to evaluate the solution at uh, from 0 to 4 pi at 1000 points we also want to evaluate the exact solutions and compare them with the result of the Runge kutta solution so exact uh, is only at 50 points so basically exact here is the markers and the solid curves are the Runge kutta solution and then uh, okay so we have our od solver and we call the Runge kutta method on this array of x values and it returns a uh, double array all right now it can in fact return a complex array but uh, the complex array here or maybe go, we go back here OD system solver complex so if I call the double the 2D double array on the Runge Kuta it basically returns a two dimensional array that the rows represent separately the real part and the imaginary part of the solutions if I call the complex one it returns a 2d array of complex numbers each row is the complex solution of each function right so here the this 2d complex array has base is basic the number of rows number of rows is equal to n number of equations number of equations that we already have here uh, basically if I call the double solution here the number of rows is 2n twice the number of solutions because now each row is real part plus and the other the next row is the imaginary part of the solution okay but uh, so in this example I want uh, to get uh, the real part and imaginary parts and plot them separately so when I get this z0 is the solution of the y1 the first function the real part z1 is the solution of the first function y1 the imaginary part z2 is the solution of the second function y2 the real part of it and z3 is the solution of y2 the second function the imaginary part of it all right and then i create my chart plot the x values y1 real and uh, with blue color so the blue one is the real part, the real part of y1 and then y1 image with the black color so this black one is the imagined part of y1 I also plotted the exact solution with markers and uh, as you can see this Runge Kuta solution for our complex system matches perfectly with the exact solution all right and here's the y2 solution again the same thing the solid ones are the real and imaginary part of the Runge Kuta and the dot the markers are the exact solution the real part and imaginary part as you can see it's a perfect match so our implementation works uh, great all right now the last thing here is that in order to make life easier for ourselves uh, we can create a uh, helper class with a private constructor so we don't want the user to instantiate it okay now this helper class uh, has one method get ODE which is a static method all right but it is overridden so we're doing method over uh, it is overloaded so we're doing method overloading why because uh, we want the user to easily basically call this uh, class ODE 
and call the get ODE function. It's much easier to remember because we, ha we have defined four different types of ODEs, right? Uh, and the method, because we're using method overloading, the method already takes care of which one to call based on what kind of drift function the user passing, right? So if user call the get od method with a drift function, the type of drift function, it means that the user wants to use the one to solve one ODE of a one real valued function, right? It's a real ODE with a real valued function. If the user call the ODE method, exactly the same method, get od with a derive n function, it means that the user wants to solve a system of real valued ODE functions, right? A real ODE system, an ODE system with real valued functions. So if the user calls the get ODE with the derive function complex, it means the user wants to solve one ODE equation with a complex function as the solution. If the user calls ODE, get ODE, again, the same method, but overloaded. With derive, fun derive n function complex, it means that the user wants to uh, solve a system of ODEs with complex functions, right? The solutions are complex functions. So I think this is easier for in terms of usability because you just call this ODE and one of the static methods. And which one is called, uh, the compiler determines based on which function the user is passing it as uh, the descriptor of the ODE system, all right? So I hope this enjoy, you enjoyed this video and uh, uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.